you haven't done so yet, please pause the video and read the question. We are asked to find the point at which a boy loses contact with an ice mound as he's sliding down the side of it. In this picture, this green blob, unfortunately, represents the boy. And of course, we have the ice mound pictured as well. And the first thing that we can do is draw a free body diagram of the boy at this point of his slide. And we'll note that there are only two forces acting on the boy. You have the gravitational force pulling straight down on him, and then the normal force directed perpendicular to the ice surface at this point. What we can do next is basically zoom in a little bit on the object and get a closer look at these forces. Now we'll notice that we superimposed a y-axis and an x-axis on top of the boy, the object in this question, which is located right at the origin. Now the normal force is directed precisely along the y-axis, but the gravitational force is actually working at an angle. And let us go ahead and define an angle theta between the gravitational force and the y-axis. We will see later why this angle is important. And since the gravitational force is acting at an, at an angle, it's going to be useful to break it into components. We'll have a y component directed along the y-axis this way, and then the x component will be directed parallel to the x-axis that way. And through the wonders of trigonometry, we should be able to figure out that the x component, excuse me, the y component can be represented as fg times the cosine of the angle we drew, and the x component can be drawn as fg times the sine of the angle that we had established. The next key thing to note is that when the boy begins to just slip off the surface of the hemisphere, the normal force is no longer going to be present. And that should make sense if you think about it, because if he's just slipping off the surface, his body is no longer touching the surface. And if the body is no longer touching the surface, the surface cannot push back on that body, and so there will be no normal force. So we can actually clean up the free body diagram and get rid of the normal force. The next key thing to note is that because the boy is traveling in a circular path, there must be a centripetal force acting on the boy in order to keep him moving in that circular path. Now the centripetal force must point towards the center of the circle. And if we go back to this picture, the center of the circle is of course roughly here. And we can see that the component of gravity that points towards the center must be the centripetal force acting on the boy. I'll say that again because it's really important the component of the gravitational force that's pointing towards the center of the circle is the centripetal force that's keeping the boy along the circular path. We would next recall that centripetal force is represented in the following equation. And since we just noted that the component of gravity along our y-axis is the centripetal force, we can go ahead and substitute that in for Fc. Let's go ahead and replace fg with an equivalent expression, mg, since fg is equal to mg. And then since math, uh, mass appears on both sides of the equation, we can cancel that out, leaving us with the following result. And indeed, if we multiply both sides of this equation by r, we can come up with an expression for v squared. Now this is a result that of course is not our final answer, but we're going to use it later in a conservation of energy. So it's important to go ahead and write this down, maybe circle it so we don't lose sight of it, and we'll refer back to this result in a second phase of this question. So for this next phase of the problem, we're going to use the conservation of energy. Now of course the conservation of energy says that the, the total initial energy will equal the total final energy, as long as friction or air resistance is not present. What we need to note about the initial energy is that because the boy starts from rest, there is no kinetic energy. But because he begins his slide at a height, 
and that height actually is the radius, there will be some gravitational potential energy. So initially we do have gravitational potential energy because of his height, but again no kinetic energy because he starts from rest. So we can substitute in the expression for gravitational potential energy for the initial energy. For the final energy, the boy is moving, certainly, because he slid down the side. So there will be kinetic energy at the final point, and there will also be some gravitational potential energy because the boy has not yet returned to ground level. He still has a height. But it's that height that we will need to determine. Notice that it is no longer the full radius of the circle because the boy has descended from his initial height. Now, if we look carefully, we've constructed a right triangle right in here and we are set to determine that height right there for the final gravitational potential energy. The radius of the circle of course is marked and this is the angle that we had determined in phase one of the problem and we should be able to use trigonometry to show that the height at the final position is equivalent to r times the cosine of that angle. If that's not clear, please let me know in the comments and I can provide a little bit more explanation. So, to recap, the final total energy will consist of both kinetic, because the boy is moving, and gravitational potential energy. Let's go ahead and substitute in the expressions. Once again, note that the height for the final position is the radius times the cosine of the angle. Now, mass appears in all three terms of this equation, so we can go ahead and cancel it. And recall that we had concluded from phase one of the problem that v squared can be represented as g times r times the cosine of the angle. So let's rewrite the equation by substituting v squared with g r cosine theta. Now g appears in each term of the equation so we can cancel it. And of course r appears in all three terms as well so we can cancel that. Term. Notice there would still be a 1 left on this side of the equation. We'll go ahead and multiply this equation, both sides of the equation, by 2. We'll come over here. We'll combine the cosine theta terms and finally divide both sides by 3. Leaving us with the cosine of theta equaling 2 thirds and then of course to solve for theta we can simply take the inverse cosine of 2 thirds which gives us 48.2 degrees. Now we were asked to find the height at which the boy falls off and we recall from right over here that the height was r times the cosine of theta. So let's finish this off by calculating the height as r cosine of theta. Indeed we didn't really even have to find the angle because the cosine of theta, that term right there, we knew was two-thirds. So in fact we're simply going to take the radius and multiply by two-thirds. And I've painted myself into a corner here, but that gives us exactly 9.2 meters, the height at which the boy leaves the hemispherical mound of ice.